Have you ever heard that quote that goes, a wise person will learn from their mistakes, but an even wiser one will learn from the mistakes of others? That is especially true when it comes to homesteading. If you were to do a quick search for the word homesteading or farm life or hobby farm, the images that pop up are extremely picturesque. I mean, everything from the chickens to the countertops, even the people, everything is pristinely clean and calm. But committing to a homestead life means that you want all of it because you're not only going to get the idyllic rural life, but that you're also up for the grind, unpredictable weather, inevitable animal escapes, and there's also crop failures and broken equipment. There's also this closeness to the full and continuous pattern of life and death that you just don't experience in the city and the suburbs. Before you even get to your homestead, you can learn what you shouldn't do, not because you made the mistake yourself, but because you learned from others. Plenty of homesteading veterans willingly share the mistakes that they could have avoided in hopes of saving newer homesteaders time and money. In a blog post, Jill Winger, founder of the Prairie Homestead, said 10 years in, if there's a homesteading mistake to be made, well, we've made it. And in this article in which she is painfully candid, she writes, from poisoning my garden to rebuilding a certain fence line two separate times to more kitchen disasters than I can count, our journey into this modern homesteading life hasn't been without a whole lot of mess ups. Taking on a homestead without prior experience is a recipe for disaster, which is why I've started learning homesteading skills in a townhouse in the city without land or livestock while I work a full-time job. Now, when I tell people that, they react in one of two ways. The first is that they deny that that can even be done, and the second is they ask me, well, how? But what I tell them, or they see right here on my channel, that I'm canning about 450 to 500 jars of my family's meats, fruits, and vegetables, or that I'm growing over 200 herbs, fruits, and vegetables right on a townhouse deck, and that I know how to care for and raise quail and chickens and butcher them, well, I usually win them over. Those accomplishments aren't because I'm special. It's because I'm heeding advice. So let's listen to five mistakes that you can avoid with homesteading before you even start from a few experienced homesteaders. This barn taught me one of the first and probably most important lessons about farming, and that is the importance of keeping your spaces flexible. Until you really know what purpose you need every space to serve, it is very helpful to keep an open mind and literally modular way of thinking about how you can best use the space to serve your actual needs. I made a modular stall here. And then because one of my goats was pregnant, I knew that I would also need to have a kidding stall and a place to milk once she had actually given birth. The thing is though, this is a pretty small stall. Later on, if I got bigger or different animals, I wanted to be able to easily pick this up and remove it or reconfigure it differently in the barn. Whether it's a container or ingredient or piece of equipment, start buying and building with a multi-purpose mindset. One of the things that I like to do whenever I am making or building or purchasing something is to see how many different ways I can use that particular item or how many uh, different ways or how long I anticipate having it in the future. And if the juice isn't worth the squeeze, I either know that A, I don't need to buy it or B, I need to hold out and get something that does have multifunctionality. The next important lesson that this space taught me was the importance of not waiting until conditions are perfect to do whatever it is that you need to do. My grandpa always said, use what you've got to get what you need. And when the craft school that I'm building was hugely delayed and I still needed to be able to use my tools and do woodwork without a space available, I decided to convert this into half animal barn, half wood shop. It means that I have to be flexible in my thinking. This is not going to be pristine space. I'm probably gonna to have to get some rust off my tools from time to time. And there's always gonna be weird considerations like having your animal food bins or even a compost tea brewer going in your wood shop when you might just want a really nicely organized, beautiful, calm space in which to work. Even when I get a few acres, setting up a homestead is something that takes years, if not decades. So getting used to the in-between stages or not exactly how you want it is something to embrace both now and into the future. The fifth thing that I wish that I knew was the importance of managing my own home and getting my home systems down while I'm homesteading. If your household is not functioning on a basic level, 
then you're going to have a really hard time adding on things like animals or gardens or preserving or anything like that. Spend some time and make sure your household systems are functioning completely before you add too many things on the homestead. Once you get your household running really well, kind of like clockwork, then you're going to be able to add so much more into your homestead schedule, get so much more done, and it's going to be a lot more gratifying because at the end of the day, you're going to come in and your kitchens will be clean, your laundry will be done, and you're going to feel a lot better about the whole thing. Amen, sister. Now, while I don't think Carolyn is saying that your house needs to be perfect, you still need to attend to the non-homesteading parts of your life, like kids, school, and appointments, which still requires time, energy, and attention. I really liked what Maya talked about getting information and learning from people, um, and that just saves you those mistakes because you can learn from other people who've already made mistakes rather than just bumbling through it yourself, and we did a lot of bumbling at yeah. the beginning. One of the things that we really messed up on on our old farm was we really like, we overtaxed our land because we didn't really understand how important it was to steward pasture and soil, no matter where you are in your journey, to turn your waiting room into a classroom. Just because you're living in an apartment or you're doing an office job right now doesn't mean you can't learn these things. Because if you understand soil management and you understand rotational grazing and regenerative agriculture, when you get your property and you get to start, you are starting in such a better place than if you wait until you're there to figure it out. Because you can make a lot of detrimental mistakes by getting in over your head and taxing your land. Man, that quote from Jess just really hits because it is easy to lose sight of the fact if you're someone that doesn't have access to their own land or livestock that a new homesteader that perhaps does have land actually has the potential to make uh, very expensive mistakes both with their money and time that the same beginner with uh, a similar kind of starting point doesn't and i mean that is a game changer because our time and money are all limited resources and so when i think about the fact that i am able to volunteer at a friend's uh, backyard uh, homestead and learn how to keep chickens and quail and to hear why she uses or prefers this particular coop and not this one and when we had to do the repairs on the other coop and not to the others you know all of that really makes sense that i can leverage my time of waiting to learn skills with others learn through books learn through videos learn through uh, volunteering and application in a way that if you just are relying on yourself perhaps and access to land and not taking that time to learn as much as you can and apply in small steps um, it makes your your waiting room uh, a space that you want to embrace before stepping in to your homestead i would say we probably didn't even take our own advice so we tell people to start small we also teach people to stay small. I wrote my entire book, you guys, on the principle that small scale farming rocks, right? And we should just really not feel the need to go all in. So we had four or we had one acre at our last farm. We have 4.3 acres here. We had all the paddocks, we had all the infrastructure. We had everything ready to bring animals onto our farm. And so what we do? <laughs> we go big or go home, what I say not to do. And so we got pigs, probably more than we should have. We got goats, I think the perfect amount. <laughs> Are you telling on me right No, 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 I'm painting a picture. <laughs> and so we got sheep. And what happened is we got all of these different animals that required something differently and we didn't quite have all the things in place that we thought we did. And so we get on here and we talk about the sheep got out, made my cottage garden. But what I realized after I stopped being mad <laughs> was that I didn't take my own advice. That I didn't start small. That we didn't have the systems in place that we needed to where our pigs wouldn't get out, right? Our hot water quit working. We didn't prioritize fixing that. We thought, ah, we'll get to it. It'll be okay. You don't have to have 10 pigs to be able to raise pigs for your family. You don't have to have a thousand chickens to be able to not have to buy eggs from the grocery store. Because right now we have so much food that to process all of our animals, we'd have to buy more deep freezes. 
And we don't even have room for more decreases. I always love the refreshing honesty from Jill and Nate at Whispering Willow Farms. And I remember when she moved from her one acre property to her four uh, acre farm, which did have a lot of infrastructure. And so seeing how she and her husband recently had to stop to reevaluate that what they were trying to um, maintain and also the protection that they were receiving from their farm was just way too much to the point of then realizing wow, we've already bought multiple deep freezers. If we are going to maintain what we have, we have to buy you know, at least one more and some other operations. Is something that, um, if you've heard of like clutter creep, homestead creep is real too. And the fact that she is just so transparent in saying that small farms are production powerhouses. And so you can really, with the right systems in place, have enough. And you can just put a period at the end of that sentence and, you know, just be just be satisfied with um, a, a smaller scale operation. And one of the things that I'm realizing even now in my small uh, townhome is that, no, I am not harvesting, you know, bushels of beans every day. But I already have a deep sense of satisfaction, even just from the small basket that I have that we that my husband and I can eat for dinner tonight. And just growing, you know, being able to grow to the garden and harvest a handful or two of cherry tomatoes. Like there, therein is the satisfaction. It's not always about, you know, uh, the quantity. And so that's always a good reminder that the tiny but mighty farm is something that is just as powerful as any other large scale operation. We thought that homesteading would save us lots of money. Again, this was my frugal self talking, and I had these visions of a milk cow or chickens or homegrown meat saving us millions of dollars in grocery bills, and our budget would never be the same. Well, our budget was never the same, but it wasn't quite in the way that I was expecting. Homesteading, contrary to popular belief, actually costs money. And when you think about it and really break down the numbers, a lot of times growing your own food, especially things like dairy or eggs, actually costs more than the grocery store. And that's a little bit disappointing if you're having visions of free milk. Now, all is not lost, and I'm not trying to discourage you from getting animals or adding food production into your homestead goals because it's still really worthwhile. And you have to keep in mind that you're also getting quality of life, experiences for your kids, skills that you're learning, and a much, much higher quality food product. So for example, our, our milk cow cost us about $2,000. And she eats a lot of hay every year when the summertime pastures dry up. So the food that we feed her and the expenses that she brings into our budget probably, actually not probably, definitely costs more than we just going to the store every week and buying a gallon of milk. But we're getting raw milk, it's high quality, we get all the cream, we get as much as we want. And so there is a trade-off there, but I caution you, to not be like us and come into homesteading expecting it to be much, much cheaper or to save you lots of money because that's just not always the case. Jill hit the nail on the head with this one, and that is that while over the long term homesteading can save you money, there definitely is that initial investment that you're making in the first years on your homestead, and really even prior to that. I know that for the past now six years that I've been canning, those initial years I was building up my canning inventory. I'm also getting different supplies that I want to use now for the long term uh, in my kitchen. And so really just always being mindful of cost really tends to have um, you develop these kind of thrifting skills or just being aware of your budget. And so in a lot of my videos, I'm always sharing what I thrifted either for you know our home or the garden or kitchen or appliances because it is a way that we are able to in doing so that is me saying yes, not only to some of the skills and equipment that we need now, but also saying yes to making sure that our budget makes sense right now for our eventual move. And so while there are certainly things that are going to be um, cheaper on the homestead, there are also going to be a number of expenses that we are not paying for right now. And so while we are in our waiting room, it is considering the fact that, okay, if we had you know this livestock here on our property what would be the monthly additional cost and could we afford that you know right now on our incomes 
And so I think even now being able to live with margin and below your means is critically uh, important because there are always going to be, you know, different uh, expenses initially that kind of come up. And I think this also ties into some of the tips earlier in terms of really scaling over time and taking your time with things so that you're not stretched out um, financially, emotionally, or time-wise. And so I really appreciate that even now Jill is saying that it's not always going to be cheaper. And so knowing that, you know that when it is time to kind of pay a little bit more for a piece of equipment that will be better over the long run, it's likely the better choice to do that versus um, to you know spend your money on a temporary fix. And so while homesteading isn't always cheaper, it is definitely worth it, but it does mean that you do have to be mindful of your budget. Pre-learning homesteading skills is the best way to avoid making the biggest homesteading mistakes on your property. But hey, no one's perfect, so always use an opportunity to leverage your learning, like this. Moving across the country gave me the opportunity to put 10 years of chicken keeping to the test in designing the perfect chicken coop. I had imperfect coops that had problems with predators. I had had stationary coops that burned the earth below them. I had tried every kind of waterer and nesting box and all those things. So when I came here, I knew that I could build a permanent coop that would solve all of the problems I had with my temporary solutions prior. So I designed this coop around a trailer that had a grate as a bottom. This grate is thicker and stronger than chicken wire, which is not predator proof, but this is. I hate cleaning up chicken poop, so this grate also serves another purpose in that all the poop will fall out of the bottom and I never have to clean chicken poop again. Large farms need their equipment to be mobile, and so wanting to have my chickens follow my cows so that they could eat the fly larva out of the cow poop so I didn't have fly problems, I wanted to be able to pull the chickens around. But in so doing, I also didn't want to have to carry buckets of water across 15 acres to give the chickens water, so the roof collects its own water. The thing can be towed, it has built-in nest boxes that can collect several days worth of eggs, and there's all kinds of other bells and whistles that solve other problems too. And when we do actually make things permanent, it's also okay to make them a little fun. So this is a perfect quarter scale replica of the barn. To learn more ways to say yes to your farm dream in a small space and in your spare time, click on the video on your screen. I'll see you in my kitchen or garden soon. Take care, friends.